I am going to turn this over to uh, Zach Bohani, uh, who will, who will um, continue the, um, the overview and jump into the um, 4C um, conversation. Thank you, Zach. Great. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here to tell you about the 4C consortium. I have to say, I'm really looking forward to our keynote speaker because sharing data effectively is at the center of, um, is really at the center of what uh, has been I2B2. The fact that we could share our results and our analyses across data that I want to remind everybody had been for years locked up in our EHRs was transformative. And that was a big impetus between the I2B2 and well then also OMOP and other uh, EHR extraction summarization processes. And so when uh, the uh, COVID epidemic happened, uh, it was, I was waiting for the community of leaders in the government and public health at hospitals to come together and share data. And sadly, that did not happen. Uh, and things were happening in Italy and Spain that would have informed, uh, for example, clinicians in Massachusetts and New York about the coagulopathy, but we instead were, were gathering this anecdotal evidence through chats, through phone calls, through Zoom meetings, through occasional delayed um, publications. And it became clear to me that there was a consortium, a group of indiv individuals who understood deeply what electronic health records were capable of doing and also what their limitations were. So I reached out to the I2B2 Transmart community and I was gratified and frankly a little surprised that within days, within days of putting together um, an email, we had a uh, Zoom call that included uh, on the order of, I can't see the exact numbers here, but it was, yeah, 96 uh, participants on the Zoom call representing uh, countries, uh, I think uh, five countries. And we were able to put together a plan that we need to move fast, and that getting data, sharing data is worth more than getting complete uh, data later. So we really need to find out what is happening to our patients what is the clinical course of the disease and leverage the fact that we understand deeply um, what the data looks like. And here is also an important point that cannot be overstated. Through our community, we actually trust each other and each other's expertise. And why is that important? Well, uh, you're all aware of the um, withdrawal of two publications. And uh, recently, one from the Lancet and one from the New England Journal of Medicine. And I think there's general consensus that a lot of statistical analyses would have not rapidly identified that there was a problem there. But there was a lot that was unstated about how the data was obtained. And those of us who work with AEHR data know that those, da those um, details matter. Moreover, we know who has experience and that you need to, that each site has to look at its own data in order to understand it. And so that's why we were very, very um, suspicious of these publications even before they were, were withdrawn. And conversely, why we've had a lot of trust in this community, which has the exact experience that is irreplaceable because until some magic moment, which is not gonna happen for a while, the differences of each system, health system, matters. The practice of medicine, how it varies, matters. And so the community that you represent, that we represent, 
is essential for effectively mining the data. We also understand very well the regulatory and ethical framework. And so that led us to not look at massively complex uh, data use agreements, nor seek uh, institutional review board approval for individual level uh, data analysis because there just was no time. And again, I refer back, I refer you ahead to John Wilbank's keynote uh, speech because that's really on point. So we focused on aggregating at the hospital level and then analyzing in a meta analysis those aggregates, which turned out to be extremely effective and timely. And again, in some of the other analyses that you heard about, like Surgisphere, you, they did not even share the hospital level aggregates. And again, because it's been part of the um, makeup of our community, not only do we share data, we share methods, we share code. And that really was, uh, our, gave us the ability to do a rapid cycle refinement of our analytic methods. And so this consortium uh, for clinical characteriz characterization of COVID, that's four C's. So we call it the four C uh, consortium. Um, we used our trusted uh, uh, nonprofit organization, I2B2 Transmart, to organize us. Initially, had 96 hospitals over five countries. Today, we're, we're actually over 200 hospitals, but that's how it started. And for our first study, we were able to put together in four weeks, just four weeks from that first email, uh, 27, 000, almost 28,000 COVID-19 positive patients. And we had thousands of Slack messages. I think we had about 5,000 Slack messages within three weeks with weekly Zoom meetings, if not more often. And we used simple tools, ran all the analyses uh, locally, and got um, from all the hospitals uh, non-human subjects uh, waivers uh, because it was all aggregate data that we were sharing. So with that, um, I want to uh, pass the baton to uh, Griffin, who can take it from there. Griffin. Griffin? Hello. Um, is there a way I can share my screen? Hello? I hear you. So presumably we hear you. Hey, Griffin, I just promoted you to a panelist. You should be able to share your screen. Okay, great. While Griffin's setting up, let me just say that I want to add my thanks uh, to uh, Dell Technologies because right at the beginning of the COVID uh, crisis, our colleagues at Dell, who had been tracking us for a while, realized that unlike many other national efforts, we were good to go right away. So with the most bare bone uh, process I've ever seen of review, they immediately injected us with um, resources, which allowed us not only to have the resources, but more importantly, the confidence to move forward in the ways that you just heard. Back to you, Griffin. Thank you, Zach, for that introduction. It's always great to be here at this annual symposium, even if it's remotely this time. I'm going to be talking a bit about the technical details of what we did in the 4C consortium, and then following me, Gabe Brad will go over some of the results. So this is just kind of a lead into it. A um, good way to start is to kind of put this in context about what our informatics colleagues were challenges that they had in each of the months leading up to this in March, April, and May. And this provides some of the context of what we were able to do in the initial phase of this project and what we're looking at in subsequent phases. So if you remember all the way back in March, which seems like a very long time ago, um, our biggest problem was we couldn't, we didn't even know how to find the patients who were COVID positive. The, even the name COVID was fairly new at that point. Things were called novel coronavirus and other names to it. Um, at that point, there wasn't any specific coding for COVID. Uh, the CDC was recommending using 
ICD-10 code B9729 other coronaviruses plus other things in combination with that. The first LOINC codes for lab tests didn't appear until at the end of January, but even the hospitals that were doing COVID testing weren't yet using these LOINC codes. They had their own custom codes and in institutions, and the results of the lab tests were in clinical notes. So it was hard to even find the patients who were COVID positive. In April, uh, the challenges shifted a little bit. Um, now we're able to find the patients who are COVID positive, but uh, it was all about getting the most recent data. The number of patients with uh, coronavirus were growing exponentially. So even if you were a week old in your data, you may be missing more than half of your patients. The clinical course for coronavirus is two to three weeks. So the patients that you do have, if they're a week or two old, you don't have the outcomes for them yet. And then there are new codes coming out all the time. The CDC switched to ICD-10 U07.1. Um, there are new one codes um, being released every week or so. Uh, and then another challenge we had is just the test. At that point, we're taking several days from the blood being drawn, the, the nasal swab being done until the uh, results came in. So at this point in time, most ITP2 sites were only updating their data at most once a month. And sometimes it was much less than that. Generally, that's okay. If your institution has several years worth of data and you're researching uh, a retrospective study, uh, the fact that you don't have the most recent month of data is okay. And also, usually the last month of data within institution is problematic anyway because the source systems are updated at different frequencies, billing codes get changed all the time, so the data is just less reliable. Um, but for coronavirus, we had to get our sites updated as quickly as possible. Many of us changed our ETL processes to try to target um, a minimum of twice a week updates. Uh, this was quite challenging. A um, full update of an ITB2 site might take days to run. So you start hitting up to the point where the uh, length of time it takes to update your database is longer than how often you want to uh, update it. So different sites have different approaches, such as um, partial incremental nightly updates or just updating your COVID patients at once a twice a week and leaving the other patients for the um, longer repeat cycles. Finally, in May and June, we've gotten the data, we know how to find the patients, but now it's about how do you determine severity and outcomes. This is what everyone kind of wants to know now. Why do some patients do better than others? Can you, and how early can you determine this? There are a couple approaches to doing this that hospitals use. One is looking for direct outcomes, but unfortunately these are really difficult to get. Um, uh, one outcome measure might be where the patient's in the ICU. It usually isn't a specific code for ICU, and a lot of hospitals have temporary ICUs, ranging from floors that have been repurposed to even having patients in the hallways of hospitals. So it's really hard to even quantify whether a patient is in the ICU or not. Um, ventilator settings, the procedure codes aren't usually assigned until the patient is discharged, or the uh, information might be bedded in notes or flow sheets. And death is not coded in a standard way between institutions. Hospitals may only know about patients who died within the hospital, and it may be stored in different types of um, systems. So we quickly learned within the 4C consortium that it's trying to get outcome measure like this, ICU, ventilator, death, is going to be really tricky because many sites may not be able to do it, or it's, uh, uh, we can't come up with a standard script, for example, that would uh, get in a consistent way. The other way of doing it is looking for proxies for outcomes. So how do you can you define a, a definition of severe disease based on the codes that we all have? Um, so one way of doing this is looking for patients who are COVID positive, who are inpatients as opposed to just got tested and were sent home. Uh, there are a number of common medications that are used when a patient is ventilated or is having severe cardiac problems. These are highly specific medications where if the patient is COVID positive and on one of these medications, they are very likely to be severe. Um, they may not capture everyone, but uh, we can at least use this to come up with a subset of patients who are very ill. And then blood gases, typically things like arterial blood gases won't be ordered for a patient unless they're in a severe state. And the second approach using these proxies is what uh, we mainly adopted for 4CE and other consortia are also looking at that same approach just because it's easier and more standard way to get to a definition of severe patients. There's gonna be a lot more about the ACT network later in this consortium, so I'm not gonna talk much about this, 
there's, there's a couple points I need to men mention really briefly about this. This is a large federated network that can connect dozens of hospitals around the United States. It's over 100 million patients in it. It uses a software called the Shared Health Research Information Network Shrine to connect ITB2s. The two key things that ACT did early on in March and April that really made 4C possible is that, first of all, it helped get sites up and running with um, more frequent uh, uh, data updates. This is early on a number of test sites uh, working together to see how quickly can we update our data sets and are there different ETL or other approaches to make sure at least the COVID patients have up-to-date information. And the other thing they did was develop, this is largely out of Pittsburgh, uh, developed a detailed COVID-19 ontology for ITB2 that uh, maps these various concepts, uh, the specific medications we're looking at, the COVID test results to thousands of local possible codes, both US-based codes and international codes. So we didn't have to come up with all of this for the 4C consortium. We're able to leverage this ACT ontology to give sites lists of codes that they can search for for the queries we wanted to uh, run. The phase one architecture, as well as uh, what we call now phase 1.1, has each site doing analyses locally. So you generate local counts and statistics. Uh, and then this can be out of ITB2. There are a few sites that used OMOP. And in phase one, we generated four simple CSV files that have some basic counts or means or standard deviations in there. One for daily counts, patient demographics, diagnoses, and labs. These aggregate only files were then sent to a shared consortium Dropbox that was set up by the foundation. And then we were able to merge these into analysis and visualize them. And I said more of those results will be uh, presented by Gabe and then tomorrow as well in the user interface meeting. Four files are, first there was a daily counts file. So this is for each calendar day, how many new positive cases that a hospital have, how many patients were in the ICU and how many deaths were occurred. Uh, we were hoping to get this information, but we also sort of learned that a lot of hospitals don't have this. Sites could either um, mask small counts with a negative one, or if they just don't have that information, this time Beth Izzo, I didn't have um, up-to-date death information, would indicate that with a negative two. It was a demographic file where we're capturing um, sex and age groups. For laboratory tests, this is really hard. There's hospitals have different codes for laboratory tests. They're in different units. In order to uh, limit the scope of what we're doing, working with Gabe, Brad, and others, we came up with a, a set of about a dozen or so specific laboratory tests, which had been mentioned in the literature as important in studying COVID patients. And we specified these, provided reference ranges and units for uh, institutions to try to find these uh, laboratory tests within their EHRs. The laboratory tests are coded based on relative days to when the patient was uh, had a positive COVID test result. So what this allows you to do is track the trend of laboratory tests so before leading up to the um, uh, leading up to the COVID positive test result, and then following it um, from day one, two, three, four, as far as the as far as the data that we had. At this point, again, we're we hadn't been very far into the pandemic, so a lot of patients were still in the hospital, so we weren't able to see their entire clinical course. Um, but for some of the earlier patients who were diagnosed in March, we had several weeks of data for them. A diagnosis table, we just asked sites to provide all the ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes of patients since they were diagnosed. And we learned several things from phase one. Uh, Gabe will show the, the clinical results from this, but from the technical side, we learned that it was an amazing unpaid effort from sites. They were able to pull together in a very short period of time, analysts, programmers, all IRBs, everything that was needed in order to run a ser series of database scripts. I wrote it out in SQL Server, it was ported to Oracle, and sites ran it in OMOP, and uh, we were all able to actually run these queries, which was somewhat remarkable. It sounds really simple to create four CSV files with aggregate counts, but there are a huge number of complexities. Um, with 100 different hospitals involved in this, there were different IRB and aggregate count obfuscation policies we had to work with. Um, we were trying to figure out, we were talking about the dates, we were talking about the lab specimen date, the result dates, 
when patients were referred and you don't know what the test date was, how do we even come up with a date for a patient? Uh, most COVID positive patients we learned are just sent home and we have no other data for them other than they had a test. Uh, as I mentioned before, ICU dates, ventilators, deck dates are uh, not available or difficult to get a lot of sites. Many sites have um, loin code mapping problems or unit problems. It may be one laboratory test code and the hospital uses different units for it, but it's all kind of merged together and you don't even know which result when corresponds to which unit. There's confusions over which diagnoses to query. Are we talking about the diagnoses after the patient was uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 or before, or just the related diagnoses? So this was a bit of a uh, challenge for sites. We learned about different date formats, um, different databases, SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, output dates in different formats, and there's different country standards, whether it's day and then month, or month and then day. And uh, we weren't thinking about this when we were rushing to get the data out, but as we start merging files together, we discover all these problems. And uh, the files that people uploaded had inconsistent file names, different numbers of columns. People were trying to add additional stuff to the files that they thought would be useful for us, but that makes automating the merger and analysis um, very tricky. Um, so uh, there was limited analyses that we were able to do in phase one, but we learned a lot from phase one that helped us improve this for the next phases. So right now we're in phase 1.1. Um, we address the date alignment problem by now limiting what we're doing to just the patients who are admitted. These are the patients who actually have some data and we can use the admission date as a, uh, as a clear date to align patients on. We identified a subset of severe patients using those uh, outcome proxy variables, such as medication, diagnoses, um, uh, and laboratory tests. We added two files. One is a clinical course file to show when the patient was in the hospital uh, and when they were discharged, and some medication files to see what um, drugs they're on. Uh, we leveraged the ACT ontology again to get expanded lists of uh, tests and drugs. And uh, importantly, we created a new upload and validation websites. So instead of just directly dropping your CSV files inside of a Dropbox, sites now upload their file to this web tool, which in real time tells them if there's any problems with their data set. So they are the files named correctly? Do they have the right number of columns in there? Are the, are the column data types the right type? So it does all these checks before the, the files finally end up in the, in the shared Dropbox. Sites don't like this so much because they have to keep going back and fixing things, um, but it saves us an enormous amount of effort when we're trying to merge these and analyze um, the results. The, the upload file, the upload website doesn't solve every problem. So it may check the laboratory test results and ensure that their numeric results cost to the right loint code. Um, but then we later looking at the data and we find that maybe the units are off or the was uh, log base 10 instead of natural log. These are harder for the validation website to automate the checks. We have to sometimes look at the data to understand those quality um, problems. So what we've learned from phase 1.1 so far is that um, adding more laboratories and medications is tough. Um, sites don't use the standard codes that we put in the file. Everyone has custom link, has custom link or medication codes. It can take hours for a site to do the mappings. Um, also, as I mentioned, even uh, if you have the mappings correct, there could be many different issues with the values of laboratory tests that we have to resolve. In, in phase two, we are not going to ask sites to do any more mappings. I think we need a little bit of a break from that. Um, instead of just running aggregate counts in phase two, we'll be asking sites to extract patient level data sets. So they'll still be CSV files, but they'll have row level patient information. We're not asking sites to send that to us centrally. What you'll do is run Python or R scripts on those patient level data sets. And then just the results of those analyses, the model results or again, aggregates or statistics, that will be stored up centrally and analyzed. For this phase, IRB is probably going to be needed to do those local analyses because of the um, low level data there. So the last thing I want to mention before switching over to Gabe is just sort of a compare, quick comparison of the approach we did to what some of these other efforts are doing. So there are many efforts around the world going on right now to collect and analyze EHR data related to patients with COVID-19. There may be hundreds of these. I keep hearing different kind of numbers on this. 
Um, there are different approaches based on the research questions and goals of these various consortia, and transparency is really important. So I mentioned really briefly the ACT network, that's in the US, connecting 60 hospitals to federated queries. It's fairly limited what you can do with just basic aggregate accounts, but their goal is to be able to open this up to any researcher or any of the participating sites. So this is something that where tens of thousands of researchers, for example, can be using the data that we have in our EHRs for COVID research. The 4C consortium is a smaller group of people and it's still aggregate statistics who are able to do a little bit more complicated stuff, and especially in phase two uh, when we're um, running an uh, R and Python on low level data. There's a new thing you may have heard called the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, N3C. This is being uh, funded out of the NIH um, uh, NCATS group. Um, it's mostly uh, OMA sites and U.S. hospitals, um, some external, I think. And the idea in this one is sites will be sending their row level data to a secure enclave for centralized analyses. So the types of analyses will be similar to what you can do with um, 4C phase two, but having it centralized will allow you to do even more complex types of analyses, but it is an increased risk of patient uh, uh, privacy and a lot more complexity in what institutions have to do in terms of data use agreements and local IRB. Another model is when you have an EHR vendor who can aggregate information from all the sites using their program. A nice example of this is a project called Open Safely. Um, this is based on an EHR vendor that has 40% of the uh, adult patients in England, as well as leveraging England's national death records. So you're able to combine um, data on millions of patients to be able to study um, the pandemic in that country. Um, the limitation of that is it's the, the group involved in the EHR vendor, maybe about 35 people or so who has access um, to those data. Um, but uh, you know, the, re the results are very nice that comes out of that. Trinetics, many of you are, uh, are involved with, is somewhat of a commercial version of our Shrine or ACT networks. Um, they're using a combination of the federated query approach like Shrine, as well as they've been able to centralize some patient level data for more um, 4CE or N3 type work and, and they are the, the main customers for them are pharmaceutical companies but academics also use it and um, you know, that has the potential to reach large numbers of groups as well. We Jack mentioned a couple of times Surge's figure here which is now retracted but I just listed here for comparison um, and there, that study was claiming to have data from nearly 700 hospitals and while that um, kind of didn't pan out that's kind of where we're going larger and larger hospitals connecting our 4C project up to about 200 institutions, um, ramping up to more sites. As I mentioned, there are a lot of technical challenges to resolve uh, in terms of uh, code mapping, laboratory test, uh, going to, uh, uh, unit mappings that you have to work through. But uh, we're getting there and increasing the number of sites and patient uh, um, numbers and populations. It's very exciting. Zach, before we switch over to Gabe, do you want to can I, can I just interrupt, Griffin? We have a question. I think we got it to answer at this point. Great, yes. I was in the question window, but I can read it. Um, even though we update COVID codes in the OMOP, which is serving IGB2 Act, if the hospital EHR, for example, EPIC, uh, does not have these updated codes, patients will never get counted against these updated codes, correct? If that's the case, what's the benefit of updating OMAP vocabulary? Um, in our case, two to three times a month. Right, so you know, that, there, there's two challenges there. It's both the updating frequency as well as the code mappings. The, you know, we've been working a lot with the ACT network to try to identify um, a, a additional codes for that. I think I updated, updated the latest ACT ontology. It has I think maybe 60,000 or so um, records in there. So you know, this is, this is an ongoing challenge. Even our phase, uh, 4CE phase 1.1, we discover different institutions have different types of data. The European sites don't collect race information, for example. So um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deeper issue here, yeah. which is that medicine is always changing. And if we are to rely on the underlying EHRs to change in time or as a uh, defined by our, by our existing needs, we're going to be waiting forever. Let me give you a much less loaded question. I looked at the um, 
original papers that put out, were put out by Surgesphere around COVID. They described states like hyperlipidemia. How is hyperlipidemia de uh, defined? Is it defined as a function of cholesterol? Is it defined uh, levels or is it defined as a function of ICD codes? The right answer in our world is some function of all the variables that, are, that pertain to a confident probabilistic uh, uh, measure of there being hyperlipidemia. And so having a bank of these phenotypes, uh, which is what we do accumulate in our uh, various communities and consortia around EHRs, for those who understand the uh, limits of EHR, EHRs, allows us to define those, those uh, phenotypes. So very similarly for uh, COVID, before the new um, codes are generated, we, we have to come up with probabilistic approximators, some related to NLP from narrative text, some related to some borrowed codes. But in the end, your question is well put, but my answer is waiting for the EHR vendors to update the terminologies or even the hospitals to do so is probably the uh, wrong short-term tactic. Ultimately, they do catch up, but not for all phenotypes even. I'll hold my piece there. Thank you, Zach. Jay, do you want to um, show some of yeah, our results? Great. So I'm, I'm just uh, trying to share screen here. Uh, Gabe, well, uh, since uh, we didn't do it, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. So everyone, uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to present. My name is Gabriel Brad. I'm a surgeon at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and I'm a faculty in the Department of Biomedical Informatics with Zach and Griffin. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Um, so... Uh, um, this was uh, and is uh, an amazing experience where we have gotten uh, a large group of people to work together very quickly to try to answer some very difficult questions that I think are affecting all of us around the world. So um, I'm actually very proud of what we've been able to accomplish up until now and uh, all the work that we're doing going forward. And so I wanted to spend a few minutes um, just speaking about um, the, uh, uh, our preprint and, and hopefully our uh, print. Uh, and then, um, although I will not do it justice, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time showing uh, the, the COVID clinical website, which I think um, speaks um, very much to the transparency that we use during this process as all of the data is on that site. Um, and also, uh, I thought I, I think most interestingly shows both the 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 beauty and the warts of some of the work that that uh, that we had to do. Um, uh, but to begin with, uh, you know, in in April of this year, we actually uh, published uh, in Med Archive this uh, first consortium paper. Uh, this was the uh, combined efforts of of this uh, group that. Uh, Griffin has described so eloquently. Um, and uh, in total, there uh, were 96 hospitals in the US, uh, in France, Italy, Germany, and Singapore. Uh, those uh, hospitals um, were, those weren't the total number of sites. So for example, in uh, the US, there were uh, clearly uh, multiple different sites, each of which had uh, a number of hospitals associated with them. Uh, when totaling the number of COVID-19 positive patients that we had in our data set, we had nearly 28,000 patients. Uh, certainly in April, this was uh, by far the, the, the largest uh, group of patients that had been uh, accumulated. Um, and interestingly, when the uh, Surgisphere paper came out, uh, we were all dumbfounded about just the, the sheer scale of the amount of data they had been able to pull together given the extreme amount of difficulty that it was to get this group of uh, patients together. 
Um, and this represented 187,000 uh, laboratory values. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I think, having seen Griffin's presentation, I actually uh, wanted to add one other piece of information, which is the, the data that I'm going to show you generally follows the, the, the tables that um, were collected. Um, but there's one table that uh, is one data source that is kind of uh, glaringly missing. And that um, was part of our learning from the first phase, which uh, you will, there won't be any paper that shows or any slides or uh, graphs that show the breakdown of the comorbidities, the ICD-9 codes for these patients. And that is because as Griffin mentioned, um, we found it actually quite um, complicated to use that data given how we had asked uh, groups to uh, extract this information. And so at least for our, the first phase, we learned that um, uh, I, the, the comorbidity data that we were hoping to pull on these patients um, was, was not usable. Um, and most importantly, I think kind of broadly speaking, what we also learned is given a lot of the difficulties with collecting the data and the kind of potential confounders that exist in this process, I think we, uh, in, a, in, a, in another element aspect of this that I think speaks to both the rigor and the scientific characterization of how we did this, uh, we, we limited the kinds of conclusions that we were willing to make. In other words, we weren't willing to make broad sweeping conclusions about uh, the characteristics of different medications or laboratory studies as they relate to the disease. Uh, we, we kept ourselves to the type of data that we felt could um, at least for this first phase, could, could adequately describe what we were seeing in front of us. Um, so the first thing that I, that I think was really interesting was that um, when looking at our data and comparing it to data from other sources, um, we had uh, um, a, a total number of counts that tracked relatively well with, with the data that Johns Hopkins was collecting at the time. There are now a number of other sites that are tracking COVID, um, but it, at, in late March and early April, uh, Johns Hopkins was the, the major player. And you can see that uh, across these different countries, um, our data, uh, I think, uh, represented both of how, the, how things were changing over time, but also speaks a little bit to the types of locations that we were tracking. So in Italy, for example, um, the, the hospitals that were involved um, were uh, often in the middle of the pandemic, and you'll hear more about that, I think, later. Uh, and so it is, it is not surprising that as the rates were growing in, in that country, the, the numbers in our data set were continuing to grow at a slightly faster rate. But generally speaking, this was a sanity check to show that the thing, the data that we were collecting was in line with uh, what was going on uh, around the, in these countries. The breakdown also was consistent with what we had heard uh, from other sources. So if you look at the, the country demographics, uh, so just to highlight a couple of differences, uh, you can see that the uh, breakdown, the age breakdown among those people who were identified as having COVID-19 was heavily skewed towards the elderly in, in, in certain countries in Europe, in particular in Italy, whereas there was a slightly different breakdown in other countries. And this was uh, had been described in the media. And so it was really great to see that our data uh, also consistently showed something similar. I'm gonna talk a little bit, just I'm gonna spend a few minutes just talking about um, uh, trends uh, in these lab results. And, and I, 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 I don't think that it's, it's valuable to go over all the laboratory values. There were uh, 14 labs that we pulled. And I think we were fortunate to uh, uh, look at a group of laboratory values um, that uh, turned out to be very relevant to the disease over time. Um, and so uh, I picked a couple of them just to kind of give you a sense. But what I wanted to, the reason why this slide is up is because um, I wanted to give you a sense of some of the really interesting work that is possible when looking at this. So because of the, of the way in which we broke down the data, you can see the 
uh, per country, how there are changes uh, over time uh, in the uh, labs. And while those don't necessarily represent trend for an individual patient, they represent the population of patients that remain in the hospital at a given time. So the, the, the fact that there, there are these significant differences, as you can see among these uh, countries, I think speaks to interesting variation that, that, that might exist. Um, and some of the most important labs that have been used to describe the disease from C-reactive protein to D-dimer to the white blood cell count all followed um, rates and changes over time that uh, across all these countries that were consistent with what um, we were reading in the, in, in the major literature. Um, I'll, I'll just look at two different lab results. So this is uh, the lab results for creatinine across different countries. And what you can see, I think, is what's to me fascinating as I, as I looked at this data was that uh, first you can see uh, very clearly that while there are uh, sig significant similarities between the groups at the time of presentation to the hospital, um, after uh, a couple of days, there start to be differences at the country level and certainly at, at the hospital sites. And you can see that over time, these differences e e exaggerate. And it really starts to, while it doesn't answer a specific question as to why, for example, the creatinine, which is a marker of kidney function, um, would be so different between uh, sites, it does allow us to ask the question that this is something that we should be uh, evaluating. And there are many reasons why this could be. It could be because of the types of patients that present to the hospital. It could be because of the way in which we manage the patients when they're in the hospital. Uh, it could be because of the type of medications or the equipments or the treatments that are prevalent at one institution versus another. But what was fascinating about this example was just to show that these divergences over time are suggestive of changes in patient populations that stay in the hospital. Um, uh, this is uh, another example. So this is uh, CRP. So um, what I, sh I put this on for two reasons. One is because um, the, the CRP um, was elevated uh, across nearly every institution um, at baseline, which was consistent with the kind of information that we had been hearing so that this was an inflammatory process. Um, and, and by the way, if people are asking questions, I, I apologize. I see flashes, but I can't actually tell what the questions are. So if somebody is willing, if somebody wants to uh, just uh, stop me for a second, I'm always happy to take a question. But um, the CRP, um, you can see here as a, as a great example of, it was elevated at baseline, um, and uh, we can look at some of the characteristics of it as it changes over time that are consistent with what we would expect, that for patients who stayed in the hospital for extended periods of time, their CRP would start to normalize because the pro-inflammatory process would start to normalize as well. But the thing that's also, I think, unique or valuable to see is these are the warts in our data where you can see that some of our data points were really high. And uh, when talking to some of these institutions, this was because with a very small number of patients, this was the information that they had. So both of these, I think, speak to that. Um, the final thing, the final finding from the, the, the paper that I thought was really quite interesting, and, and I would say this is maybe, to me, this was the finding that um, really struck most deeply to what we were learning was that uh, at the time in, in, in late March and early uh, April, um, we were seeing very different mortality across hospitals in, uh, around the world. Um, you know, I remember at the time, and things are relatively stable, although they're improving everywhere now, but uh, in these countries, um, you know, the mortality in, in Italy was many times higher than that in Germany. And one of the questions was, um, what can I account for these differences? Um, and so one of the questions we asked ourselves was, is, is the variation that we're seeing a country level variation, or is there variation between institutions to the point where there's as much variation internally as there is um, externally? And what we showed very nicely was that the variation we were seeing was as great between institutions within a country as it was uh, between countries. 
which speaks to the fact that there, there is no, or there was no specific hospital, or sorry, country level um, treatment paradigm that was leading to some of the changes that we were seeing. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, this, and I'm just going to quickly spend just a few minutes going over uh, COVID clinical. And again, I, I, I want to speak to the fact that, uh, you know, COVID clinical, the, the website was uh, very much um, uh, the, I think, the, the effort of a lot of people. But, uh, I, I, you know, I just want to uh, shout out to, um, um, uh, to uh, Nils Gellenborg, who you know really spearheaded this, um, and I think who who uh, deserves a lot of credit for the the appearance with his team of, uh, of what I think is a is a really compelling website. Um, so this, can I, um, Gabe, can I interrupt you with a quick question? I think is good. Um, Absolutely. Do you plan to add genomic data such as virus sequence detected on the other studies? Uh, moreover, has the geolocalization of patients been used to so far? So I think um, that is an amazing opportunity that's certainly not in kind of the, the roadmap in the next couple of stages. That is obviously the, the kinds of uh, linking of data that would be extremely valuable. Um, but I certainly, and, and I think others can speak more to this as well, but I, that is not currently in, in kind of the early, the next several stages. Um, we're, uh, as, as amazing as that would be, um, we're still trying to make sure that everyone gets their, the, the lab results right. Um, and so uh, we're, I, I think this is kind of a stepwise process. Um, it, and actually one of the things that, that is, I think most important that has been spoken to was, uh, this was a situation where instead of aiming really high, what we chose to do is we said, um, and, and I think Zach was very focused on this correctly, um, was to say that, you know, we can, we can always try to do more, but everything that we do incre increases the complexity of the effort dramatically. And so we aim to do things that appeared to be very simple. Um, and even those were a tremendous lift. And so, uh, in, but in doing so, we learned a lot. We were actually able to, to be successful. Um, I, as, well, I, just, I just want to add on to that. It's not a limitation of the technology. For instance, we'll hear later today from Paul Aviak describing it as part of the picture uh, framework. He's uh, storing uh, in I2B2 uh, literally uh, links to on the order of 100,000 whole human genomes. But the issue is not technical. So the technology can keep it. It's regulatory and organizational. So for example, we also have um, individually location data sets for our patients, but are we allowed to share them for uh, even our internal analyses against our EHR data? Also, several of us have viral sequence uh, data sets. Are we allowed to uh, link those to the EHR data for purposes beyond doing the viral epidemiology? So the short answer is going to be most likely not, but it's not that we can't write additional IRBs, but it's going to be a lift where you have to educate your institutions uh, about that. I think uh, this was an incredibly important uh, direction and this, this community, I2B2 Transmart, can and will move faster than most in that uh, space but then we have to decide to do it and we have to uh, come to grips with the regulatory uh, administrative issues, which are key here. Excellent. Um, so just, just a couple of uh, last um, elements to show uh, that I think are particularly uh, uh, interesting about this site. So, you know, the site, um, uh, when you go into the area of data, um, I wanted to just highlight a couple of the, of the elements. First is that the data obviously is organized in such a way on the back end, and Mills uh, organized this correctly, that um, this information is, is, as the data gets updated, it, it just presents itself uh, directly into the space. So this is not hard-coded, and I think that's really uh, uh, very exciting. 
The second thing is that um, there is uh, complete transparency when it comes to the different breakdown of the data. So um, if you look, for example, we had the by country and then we have the by site data, although the, the site names are masked, the information is there and available to all the different um, groups that were involved in uh, providing data. Um, you can, it, it, with regards to the patients, the variation, the characteristic, which data point exists at which time, and then for all of our uh, different uh, metrics. And one of the things that actually, as you can see, is we have the uh, reference ranges because, again, reference ranges were extremely different across countries. And so as people are looking at this site, this allows them to effectively uh, convert into their existing methods. The other thing that uh, is, is quite cool is because this was very transparent, there are some really simple tools for how to download these and, and extract this information so it could be used as an image. And then the, the part that I think is, is extremely powerful is that um, this data not only exists here, but also the code for generating it, all of this data is uh, directly linked uh, to Jupyter Notebooks um, so that you can see exactly how all of this was derived and what the information is that, that sits behind this. Um, that I think is, is, is quite impressive. When you then go back to the data, the other part that um, uh, very few groups have, although uh, I will say my experience is recently people have been much more open to this, um, the, the actual data itself uh, is it's po is it's possible to download it directly from the site, um, and so you can see here that um, as we uh, derived and grew the information on the site, uh, this was then immediately available um, from that time. And we have uh, because we're now in this phase 1.1 where we're doing another data collection soon, uh, the site will be updated with the information that is being uh, collected from the groups. So that's, that's all I have for the moment. I'm, I'm happy to take any further questions that people might have. Okay, great. So now what I'm gonna do is um, I will uh, pass on the mic to Ricardo to, uh, for his presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> so I share my screen too. Uh, while I'm presenting myself. Okay, sharing. Hope you see the, <coughs> you see the slides. Um, so my name is Ricardo Bellazzi. I work at the University of Pavia and I also uh, work together with the group in the Maugeri Hospital in Pavia. And I, my role is just to show you uh, and the talk to you about the experience that we had in the Italian hospitals that participated to the 4C initiative uh, and uh, sharing some of their thoughts. So uh, my talk is really reports uh, what uh, all those that work with me uh, in this initiative in Italy has uh, thought and experienced. And uh, one, probably one of the reasons why uh, I'm talking here is because in Italy we were sort of the first one who had to deal with this pandemic. So that you can see here at the bottom of the slide, the patient number one, who is actually running again. He's, he actually was, uh, a, uh, was a person really into athletics uh, and marathon and uh, so on and uh, then he got the disease as you know he was hospitalized in icu and finally he's back running and uh, but this uh, also means that uh, uh, well we have been able in italy to cure him but uh, uh, we also had to face with uh, uh, all the waves uh, uh, all the wave of the pandemic uh, as, uh, as a first uh, as a first cycle so I uh, just want to show you, well, here, here is Italy and this triangle here that I'm showing with the mouse is uh, uh, the province of Pavia, which is reported here. And this is just to let you see what was um, one of the main challenge that we had to face with. That is basically to deal with the flow of information that was coming from uh, the hospitals collecting cases. 
So if we move uh, uh, with the video, uh, let's, let's move here. That is the end of February. So you see from the end of February to uh, the end of April, how fast the pandemic was spreading out. And uh, you see, of course, the colors are related to uh, the numbers. And uh, in, a, in a very small area, you see how fast uh, all the cases have been uh, uh, arrived to the hospital and, all, and what was the challenge to put together information and try to uh, analyze the data uh, and, and in a way participating to the 4C uh, initiative. And uh, actually, uh, the hospitals that, that participated are mostly in the area, at least at the beginning, in this area here, the red one, Lombardy. And uh, uh, we had uh, the hospital in Bergamo, which is actually the hospital that had to uh, face with the, the, the real, uh, real uh, start of the pandemic at a, at a sort of unmanageable level. Uh, we also have uh, participating the Fondazione Cagranda Policlinico of Milan and uh, the, with the University of Pavia, this hospital here on Pavia. Later, uh, for phase 1.1, also another group of hospitals in the area of Pavia participated together with the Catanzaro Hospital in the south of Italy. And uh, uh, yes, uh, a, a very important uh, uh, information that you need to know is that uh, at least in Lombardy, these hospitals were sort of, uh, uh, they decided to work together in order to deal with the pandemic and to uh, try to have an organization first at the regional level to do that and then at the national level uh, in order to be able to manage with the request of ICU beds and uh, uh, of managing also those who were out of the most critical phases and moved to other hospitals. Uh, this, from the point of view of collecting information, is, uh, uh, makes the, the situation quite complex because sometimes patients are diagnosed in one hospital and then transferred to another hospital. That's what exactly what happened, uh, for example, in Pavia. And I'm going to talk to you about this challenge uh, just a little bit later. Talking about the, the data, yes, as uh, Gab showed before, uh, we have uh, sort of different demographics from uh, other countries. And you, you can see the same, basically the same picture uh, divided by, um, by sex here. So you can see males and females, more of course uh, males than females as, as, as it was reported uh, largely. And also a slightly different distribution of ages uh, between males and females. Let's say that the male are more, let's say, describe more, uh, uh, let's say, I would say better uh, what has been reported by uh, the news, uh, by the newspapers. Uh, I just want to start showing you what were the different solutions from the technical point of view that has been implemented by the different hospitals who participated to this uh, uh, initiative. And I want to start from the Bergamo Hospital. Uh, first of all, because they were really, uh, they had to deal with a, a, a healthcare crisis in a way that we had uh, in Italy, and they were really on the front line in a way. So they, this uh, Bergamo Hospital is one of the newest and largest hospital in Italy. Uh, as you can see here in terms of the number of beds and uh, also the buildings were quite uh, new uh, with the number of services. And uh, what is being really, uh, of course, challenging from them, you see here the cumulative curve of the, of the patients. Those are the ones that will be included uh, in the uh, 4CE 1.1, uh, let's say, so already filtered in a way. They're, they are not all the patients. But from here, you see how steep was the curve at the very beginning. And, uh, and also in this area that you can see here, data were collected uh, by the hospitals and they participated to the 4CE, even if they are really, really, really under pressure. And uh, one of the reasons why they were able to participate uh, in, a reactive, in a reactive way 
is also because they have uh, uh, in place I2B2 in Bergamo. And uh, they have in, the, in their database data coming starting in 2007. And uh, in total, around 1 million patients. But they were also able very fast to modify the I2B2 ontology in such a way that the swabs data were included into uh, I2B2. And it was possible for them to keep track of the diagnosis uh, through the results of the, uh, of the swabs data. So this was uh, also a, uh, the reason why they were able to directly upload the data uh, into the 4CE uh, system, let's say, or I would say generating the CSV file uh, in, uh, um, in such a way that uh, uh, in such a way that uh, uh, they are already immediately uh, generated from I2B2. And um, they also want to give a sort of number of feedbacks to the, to the I2B2 community. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, they really uh, had the chance to uh, exploit all the efforts that have been performed to integrate different data sources and uh, uh, relying on the combination of two different data warehouses. One is a hospital data warehouse that is then connected with the I2B2. And uh, uh, of course, they also raised the issue uh, that is quite interesting, and I, I'll go back to this uh, uh, in a few minutes, um, to that it's very important to keep track of the process of sharing the data and also uh, of, the, of those studies that, were, that are, uh, let's say, um, part of the uh, certain data sharing process. So it's, it's uh, crucial to have in place a proper system to uh, keep track let's say, of uh, all the queries that are performed, all the data expert and all the studies that are, that exploit a certain number of, uh, uh, certain type of data, let's say, in order to avoid uh, um, a, uh, excessive data reuse or un uncontrolled, I would say, data reuse. Second the data source was the Policlinico of Milano, uh, another uh, large hospital uh, with a reinstalling of I2B2 but in total, they were able to have more than 4 million patients. But the system and the overall system for keeping track of the data was not ready for directly exporting the data from I2B2. So they had basically to upload I2B2 from the hospital information system, uh, sorry, upload data into the 4CE um, uh, from the hospital information system. And uh, also, uh, well, in, also in, in, in Polyclinic of Milan, they had a steep increase, but less steep than in Bergamo, as you can see here in terms of the number of the, of the cumulative curves of the, of the patients that were uh, uh, diagnosed uh, uh, in the hospital. And uh, uh, a feedback from them is that uh, uh, together with the, the problem of uh, gathering data directly from the hospital information system, they also had to really to face with the problem of uh, uh, IRBs and uh, uh, in trying to, f to dealing with the general issue of fast IRB processes uh, to allow retrospective studies. They also, uh, they also raised the issue of the importance of governance of the data sharing process that is as, at least as important as uh, the, uh, the privacy preserving mechanism. Uh, and uh, I just want, this is my slide and I just want to mention that uh, with the International Medical Informatics Association, we really tried to study several years ago these, uh, um, this topic of uh, building system for a trustworthy uh, reuse of the health data. Um, last uh, last um, contributor of phase one was ICS Maugeri. Uh, that's where I have a lab actually. And uh, you can see a completely different curve in terms of cumulative counts of the patient. And that's because uh, ICS Maugeri is not a hospital with an ICU. 
So it's a hospital that was involved in, in managing uh, these patients um, in, uh, as a secondary uh, center to manage sort of COVID rehabilitation. And uh, so you see a steep increase here after, after, a, slow, uh, after a slow start. That's because they were into the game right, uh, after. But this has caused a number of issues from the uh, uh, informatics point of view. So I2P2 was not ready for exporting the data. So the data were uploaded in 4CE with a number of VAR scripts. They came after a strong processing of the, of the data themselves. Basically because the patients were at the first swab uh, test um, outside the ICM hospital. So um, this means that we had to perform uh, either uh, NLP analysis uh, or to do manual analysis of, uh, of the report, of the textual reports in order to be able to find the, the, the diagnosis date of the COVID patients. Also, uh, the system of the, let's say the electronic health record was not uh, design and properly design in a way to manage these COVID patients. And for these reasons, a formal code was assigned also only uh, when the patient was discharged. So uh, we had to uh, find a way really to go through the textual reports in order to uh, have a good quality uh, assessment system to uh, be able to extract the information. And then I just want to mention a number of issues that were shared by different, uh, by different hospitals uh, that uh, participated to the study, in particular in Italy, related to problems uh, of harmonization of the, of the reference unit, the detection limit, the, the recording of values below the detection limit that had to be filtered out, the mapping of the codes at an international level, and now for phase 1.1, we are dealing with the definition of uh, severe patients that, that includes additional challenges. Uh, going to the end of my presentation, I just want to mention that the initiative uh, is uh, very uh, interesting for other hospitals uh, uh, in Italy. Another hospital that has joined the consortium is the um, so-called network of, of regional hospitals of the area of Pavia. They are distributed all around the province, basically, and include small and larger hospital. The advantages here is, uh, the advantage is related to the fact that they have one single hospital information system. So they manage all the data coming from all the region uh, in the, the regional hospital in a one single uh, database. So they are, going to, uh, they are going to upload more than 900 COVID patients monitored over the period. And last but not least, I want to mention that also uh, in the south of Italy, the University of Catanzaro and uh, in the uh, Mater Domini University Hospital has joined the effort and uh, they are contributing with their data set. It is a small data set as compared with the other ones but uh, well curated and uh, for sure it will provide useful information for our assessment of the COVID uh, patients data. Uh, just to sum up, uh, I, would, I, I need to mention that this, the commitment of all of those who participated to the initiative from the very beginning uh, had a sort of heroic commitment in doing that because I know that some of the clinicians uh, were uh, involved in the collecting the data for, uh, for the 4CE initiative. We're also working all day long with the COVID patients, in particular in Bergamo. And uh, so it's, it's really amazing what the, 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 the effort that they perform also to collect data properly. Uh, they, there were issues related with data quality. There are still issues related to data quality uh, also because of the sudden challenge that the system had to deal with. But uh, I need to say that uh, 
when the uh, proper infrastructure was in place and uh, uh, I would say the know-how and how to deal with uh, reusing clinical data to support research was already uh, in place, then it was possible anyway to uh, properly collect data and to share them. Uh, finally, I want to report again what comes from the center that uh, together with the proper data sharing strategies, we'll also need in general data governance mechanism that uh, uh, can help uh, performing properly these uh, observational studies, uh, uh, ensuring that the evidence that is extracted is uh, uh, the best evidence as possible. And uh, basically that's the uh, uh, end of my presentation. By the way, I just want to say uh, that was great. You showed us things that I had not suspected and I wish I wish that could be written up as a, as a short story somewhere because Ricardo, it's so important that people understand what it actually takes to do this. So thank you. So we have time to open this up for discussion, questions. Um, please, Zach or the other uh, panelists jump in and, and add additional uh, comments if you like. All right, so I'm going to, since it's obviously, uh, since it's usually my role, I'm going to sort of uh, take the moderation role and see if uh, there are any questions of the audience or I welcome uh, comments uh, from the other panelists. I urge you to do that. Otherwise, I will start making my comments and you probably don't want to hear them. All right, I'm going to make so. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Zach. I think we have a um, we might have a question from one of the attendees. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, I believe your name is Nora. I'm going to allow this person to talk. Just one Good. second. Okay, Nora. I believe you're um, able to talk. I guess we lost him. Okay, um, Nor, if you're if you're still there, raise your hand again, and we can um, we can try to unmute you. Okay. Well, uh, I, I fully endorse, I fully endorse Dan Connolly's uh, suggestion of a laugh track for Zoom. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. All right. While we're waiting for other questions, um, I want to ask uh, some of our European colleagues, and I'll start with Ricardo. Um, I can tell you for a fact that um, in the United States, we are trying to create, and when I say we, not me, other projects, uh, a national view. The Centers for Disease Control, the ACT Network, the FDA, but we haven't succeeded. I'm wondering, are there any countries out there that have created a unified, um, real-time dashboard of clinical course, not just counts, but clinical course. I, I am mildly optimistic that something like that existed in France, perhaps, but I could be wrong, or in Germany. Um, I think Italy got hit so hard that I'd actually be surprised if there was such a thing, but I'd be glad to be surprised. So if there are any of uh, the Europeans there. I actually, I would be confident that the that Singapore uh, had such a thing, but I, again, I could be wrong. So is anybody willing to speak up to talk about if their countries have been successful in a clinical near real time or even one week delayed perspective across the healthcare of their system? It's certainly not within a shoot, uh, even uh, shooting range of the United States. I wonder if any other countries have, have that. Uh, I can say that in Italy, we don't have such a, such a, an integration. It's only, you know, we have integration at the count level uh, and uh, 
but uh, not clinical. I mean, not 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 uh, at the level that we have done, for example, in 4C. Yeah. So I, I just want to say that this is the part where I think, whereas most of the people on this Zoom are technologists like me, I think we, as we get older, which is happening fast, we need to consider taking on leadership roles. And let me tell you why. I always point out that with I2B2, we were able to identify some truly deadly things that were happening in our healthcare system that were not coming from coronavirus, but were coming from the practice of medicine, whether it's Vioxx, which killed thousands of people throughout the world, or Avandia. And in general, it seems to me that in the 21st century, it was going to become fast, seen as morally reprehensible and perhaps malpractice, not to be able to see clinical trends across our population in real time. And we can see for a fact that in these leading developed countries, we're not able to do that. And we actually have the data. We know we have the data because with 4CE, we showed with just sweat and heroic uh, effort, we were able to bring together in four weeks that initial analysis. Imagine what this could do if it really had imprimatur and investment of governments to do that. And the sad thing is many of our co-citizens believe that the government's doing that. It's not. And we're the one of the few constituencies that actually realize that it's both not happening, what it would take to make it happen, and could make it happen. And so, first of all, this will not be, unfortunately, the last pandemic in our lifetimes. And it's also not the only thing that's going to hurt our patients. And I want to repeat, some of it, what hurts our patients is how we practice medicine. And if we don't have a um, essentially air traffic control to see how our planes full of patients are going down unexpectedly, history will not be kind to us, I believe. And more optimistically, we have a lot to offer our co-citizens. So Aaron Mandel has a question. The cumulative patients infected uh, curves presented by Ricardo paints a unique picture of the change in the character of the infection rate by hospital. Ricardo pointed out a focus on the presence absence of ICU to correlate with the curve. Maybe I missed it. Was there an effort to look at the shape of the curves based on geography or distance from the epicenter within Italy? Well, I'll answer my, uh, I'll give my answer. We did not collectively do that analysis. I don't know if Italy did. Yeah, well, we, 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 we didn't uh, as a group, but uh, uh, I think that uh, in general, there are, uh, of course, uh, um, analysis done by epidemiologists also in Italy uh, that has clearly uh, shown that there's a geographic component of, uh, and it's easy to see it from all the, all the data that we have here in Italy. And um, what I, I think it was interesting, of course, from our point of view, is to see the differences in terms of type, exactly the presence or absence of ICU. While in terms of geography, uh, of, I would say, yes, there are many studies, not probably done at a clinical level, but done in terms of counts, number of hospitalizations that shows that there are such a huge regional differences. There are a lot of studies actually now trying to correlate with these, these curves with uh, um, also the decisions of the government in terms of uh, enabling or blocking uh, uh, travels, uh, as well as uh, you know the policy of lockdown, which was particularly tough here in Italy. They tried really to close down the country for uh, at least, uh, well, almost two months, uh, I would say. So uh, there are many studies that, that are trying to do that, let's say, that's for sure. Um, I, I saw another question. Ah, someone brought up the UK's uh, HIC. I think I know what they're referring to. 
I can say there was a big NHA, a National uh, Health Service data set that what was made available to authorized researchers in record time. And if Adrian can, uh, or Adriano can talk about it, uh, I'd love to hear more. I actually did not look at that data set, but I was impressed how fast that was generated. I was also very impressed with how fast a Korean, uh, South Korean comprehensive data set was generated. So Korea actually did it really fast as well. So uh, Adriana, can you speak uh, about uh, UK's HIC? Uh, Adriana, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, so this is an initiative here. So I'm based at the William Harvey Research Institute, Queen Mary University of London. And we, we collaborate with the NIHR HIC uh, dataset on COVID-19 via the Bath's Hospital Trust. And this is a very interesting, it's a very complete data set that gathers information about COVID-19 from different hospitals in the UK. So it, it is not as Adrian, are you cut out? Um, are you still there? Apparently, we're undergoing heavy uh, editing by the. Uh, coronavirus uh, cybernetic form. Dynamic as a system that you just, uh, you just collection. Hello? You were cut off for a second, Adriano. Uh, could you? Oh, yeah. Uh... yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Oh, all right. So yeah, as I was saying, uh, we, we collaborate with the HIC via the BATS uh, Trust, which is a NHS trust. And yeah, so they're collecting different data uh, from COVID-19 patients on different hospitals. And then they extract the data as it is from the local databases. And they create a, a, a secondary database in which the partners of this initiative, they have access. So it, it's a very raw state of uh, uh, data set. It's not something like the one you just presented in which we can have an interesting um, visual analytics platform to explore the data. However, it's a very rich and it's a very complete data set. So what I, can, what I can do is to put the link of this resource on the chat window, and then maybe many of you that uh, must be interested uh, can have a look in, on the description. So um, together with this data set, you have the descriptors of all the metadata in which you can have access in case you are granted access to this data set. And I think it's a very, very interesting um, resource to put together with the data that you have collected so far. Thank you for answering that question. So You're welcome, thank you. Any other questions? Zach, this is Diane. Did, did you cover um, 4C 2.0 and what you think the future is? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, Griffin uh, started, uh, began to do it, but there's obvious limitations to what can be done by doing meta-analyses across aggregate data only. Now, aggregate data for institutions, I think is going to be ne ne uh, sorry, necessary for the foreseeable future. IRB, uh, even with additional IRB uh, protocols. However, we can do a lot better by having more detailed individual level analyses done within the inst source institutions before we go to uh, the aggregate meta-analysis. And what I mean by that is that both because the IRB will appropriately look much more kindly upon 
detailed individual analyses that are done locally within your institution. And because at each of our institutions, we know better than anybody else in the world, the vagaries of our institution, including when did we cho change coding systems? When did we ch ch uh, change EHR vendors? When did we start set sending our ICU, ICU patients to a different hospital? All those differences we understand best. So therefore, for phase two, the big picture is that we're gonna be sharing very lightweight uh, scripts that can be run in a defined uh, environment, whether it's Windows or Unix, a, a script essentially that will run a set of standardized scripts that everybody agrees upon and vets. So these will be multiple R or Python scripts that get triggered as a result of these, um, of the running the, the shell script with the right standardization against a standard bare bones R environment for starters. And this will allow us to do a lot of more detailed um, analyses that gets much closer to uh, causality than the aggregate, aggregate analyses. And then again, those results will be shared only in aggregate. So we will not be sharing identifiable information across institutions. But because so much more of the analyses will have been done locally, the balance um, of, uh, will be in much more in favor of detail. In order to do this though, even if the individual level data is um, only looked at locally, you need to um, file an IRB protocol. We already have filed IRB protocols in uh, several of the four CE institutions. We've made available on our uh, Slack channel uh, the IRBs that have been submitted so that our other four CE uh, consortium members can join. I should note while we're at it that we've been very lucky that many other hospital organizations have now joined us. One of the biggest ones is uh, the Veterans Affairs Group, which includes alone probably over 100 hospitals. Um, and they also have their data in, I think, an OMOP uh, uh, format. And so the phase two uh, path is to focus on those individual level analyses, still aggregated, but in much more detail. And it is a step up in complexity. But we're trying to minimize the step up in complexity because as we change now the, the uh, underlying methodology, we're keeping relatively constant the data types uh, that we are having to harmonize until we get that phase two methodology uh, in place and also all the IRBs. So this is very exciting. And if there's any of you who are on this call and are interested in joining 4CE, um, you should know that our, um, we're, we're welcoming. We are very collegial. We're very sharing, almost painfully so. Let me tell you, when you try to write a paper with almost 100 authors. Um, and But we look for real contributions by membership. So a lot of the 4CE, in fact, most of the, the vast majority of the 4CE participants have been providing data from their institutions, which has made the, the uh, collaboration far richer. Note that there's a, a form on the ITV2 Transmart website um, if you're interested in joining 4C. So um, just you know, fill out that, that uh, form and we'll get that going. So I think we're I think we're we're absolutely on time, which is really fantastic. So we're at the end of the session. So we will take um, a fifteen minute break, and we will start up at uh, ten thirty. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you all. <laughs>